So you've assembled your adventuring party. You've met in the tavern and you've decided to go questing together, to go adventuring, to potentially save the world, or barring that, earn a fair bit of coin. But that's the question, isn't it? Where does this coin come from? Who's going to pay you? And who knows where those epic quests are and can point you in the right direction? That's where a group patron comes in. So today I'm going to break down all of the group patrons in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Chapter 2, so you know which group patron is right for you. Now, what this means is I'm not going to be going through all the material that's included in the book because, well, it's in the book. Things like the perks of joining each one or mechanical benefits that being part of a group patron can provide are all easily accessible in the book. What I am wanting to do today is to go through each of them and talk through the types of characters that would work well for this type of group patron. And additionally, for all you DMs out there, types of campaigns that can be written centered around this group patron, at least at the outset. There are of course timestamps down in the description if you wanna jump straight to one group patron just to get my insights on one particular one. So let's start at the top. Do you have a passion for knowledge? Whether it's the ancient magic of the giants or a cutting edge discovery of how the we functions, does the idea of discovering these arcane truths fuel your drive for adventuring? Then perhaps the Academy patron is right for you. So what types of characters could function really well in a game centered around the Academy group patron? So to kick things off, obviously most arcane traditions for the wizard class are going to fit in beautifully in a game centered around an Academy group patron. For one, the types of missions you're gonna be sent on are going to give you ample opportunities to find new spells for your spellbook, if not the Academy library. So that's one big perk of working for an Academy group patron. But additionally, going on these expeditions to discover arcane truths or find hidden relics, a wizard character is more than likely going to have a lot of the requisite skills required, especially knowledge type skills for those types of adventures, whether it's arcana or understanding a variety of languages, things like that will really allow this class to shine in this type of game due to the type of adventures and quests that an academy is going to send you on. But furthermore, the type of game that you can center around an academy patron is going to allow for a lot of the wizard character archetype long-term goals to fit in well in a game. You're not gonna have to deviate too much from a campaign in order to be able to fulfill a wizard character's long-term goals, such as preventing dangerous magic from falling into the wrong hands, gaining a greater understanding of how the arcane works in the world, or becoming a lich. There might be forbidden knowledge out there. So any of those things and so much more that a wizard character would want to do long-term can fit in really well in a game centered around an Academy page. Next up are the Artificers. Obviously, when you look at the Artificers flavor text, being on the cutting edge of technology in an arcane world is one of the central tenets of being an Artificer. So it makes a lot of sense that they would be working for someone who would send them on those missions to either discover ancient forgotten magic that they could then update or find something that unlocks knowledge about magic in general. But also, working for an academy just to have access to their facilities, like, yeah, yeah, I'll go on your quest for you, but can I use your lab? That's very on-brand for a lot of artificers of just, sure, yeah, whatever. I, I just need your toys. So, yeah, that also works really well if you have an academy group patron. And the last two, I don't have a whole lot to elaborate on, just obviously through their flavor and mechanics, they would work really well is the College of Lore Bard and the Knowledge Domain Cleric. Both of those make a lot of sense to work for an institution that deals with lore and knowledge a lot and the skills that they have, much like the Wizard and the Artificer, would play well into the types of missions that an Academy Group patron is going to be sending them on. So now let's talk about the types of campaigns that can be centered around each of these group patrons, starting with the Academy. Now I know that in the book, there is some great tables in each section about types of jobs, types of quests that this group patron can offer. But I wanted to take kind of a step back and look at the overarching plot lines that you could create when you know, okay, my players want to have an Academy group patron or one of the other ones that we're about to talk about. What type of overarching story can I create 
to really make the most out of this group patron. So the first one is kind of a classic, but it's a classic for a reason. The adventurers are a group of students that go on various trips for assignments and end up getting swept up into a larger, more epic story. Bonus points if there's a wizened old faculty member that's secretly helping the party because they know what they're up to despite the best wishes of the head of the school. Additionally, the players could be adjunct professors at a university working for a long tenured professor to go around and find important artifacts for them that are great danger and could surely destroy the world. Spoiler alert, the faculty member is secretly a lich searching for their phylactery. So that could be an interesting plot twist for a campaign. And the other one I thought about was the party is adventuring as normal, but they begin getting correspondence from a mysterious benefactor who's asking them to go seek out certain individuals and make contact with them. And shortly after the party makes contact, those individuals begin to disappear. Now, presumably the party would want to get to the bottom of this, but when they do track down the missing individuals and their benefactor, it's discovered that this benefactor runs an academy that's actually a front for a training ground slash HQ for young sorcerers and teaching them how to control their magic. Sorry, I had to. And before we move on, if you're enjoying this video, if you're finding it at all helpful, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really does help. And also, if you would like to talk to me about this stuff in real time, I do stream on Twitch every Sunday and Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central, link down in the description below. Would love to see you there. Moving on, there's an old saying, I'd rather work for an immortal entity bent on world domination than have an immortal entity work against me. Or something like that. Either way, if you have a hunger for power and are seeking a clear path to career growth, there are few patrons better than an ancient being. Cunning, wise, and incredibly old, these patrons have been around the block enough times to know every trick in the book. But they wouldn't use them against you. You're on their side, so you're safe. So the ancient being group patron is a really compelling one and can be a lot of fun for a lot of different player types and a lot of different campaigns. First off is the cleric's order domain. With an almost rigid devotion to the way things should be and the order of things, a cleric devoted to an elder dragon, celestial guardian, or other ancient being would surely be something special to their patron. Next up is the barbarian's path of wild magic. Now, this one I think could be a lot of fun because it makes sense that an ancient being would bestow magic on a servant that normally wouldn't have access to such a thing. So they could have a cannon to aim and unleash on the world without much concern for controlling it. If you are going with an elder dragon ancient being as your group's patron, then the draconic bloodline sorcerer makes perfect sense. This could be almost a destined relationship with the elder dragon being an ancestor of your sorcerer and, and being family and you want to help family out, right? And lastly, any warlock and any warlock, this is kind of like what warlocks are anyway, but there's another interesting way to approach it. So obviously the group patron could be the warlock's pact holder or conversely, and I would say more interestingly, if you have a Celestial Guardian group patron and your Warlock has the Pact of the Fiend, perhaps your patron promises to be able to absolve you of your pact once you complete a couple of jobs and, you know, go on the requisite quests and do this and that. And no, 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 I, it doesn't involve me like swapping the pact and like taking it over or anything. No, 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 I can just get rid of your pact, promise. So that's another interesting relationship you can build is I can get you out of this, but probably it's gonna be more of a, I then take it over. So that just something to, to play around with. And there are two types of campaigns that I came up with that I think could work really well for an ancient being group patron. Now adventuring parties working for an ancient being is nothing new. So I really tried to figure out a way to do something that could be unique to this type of relationship. And what I came up with is the first one is collecting specific artifacts and destroying them to prevent their power from being unleashed on the world. Obviously this would be a more good aligning uh, ancient being like in a good elder dragon or celestial guardian, mostly because I my, my favorite part of artifacts are the description on how to destroy them and building a game around destroying artifacts is pretty cool. Obviously for early levels, you would wanna create some like lesser artifacts, maybe just some 
really cool magic items that have specific conditions that they need to be destroyed. And then as you get higher levels, start incorporating actual artifacts from the source material into your campaign. And the other one is you work for an ancient being that is not undead, but cursed with immortality. And this curse works by they, they've lost their memory. And the only out of their immortality is to learn their true name. And the party has to basically work their way backwards. Like the, the ancient being, the group patron, has a memory. That's the start of the thread. And so maybe they remember the point at which they were cursed. And so they have to go to that place. And then there's a reverse breadcrumb leading them all the way back to who this individual was and what their name was. And once they discover the name, they're set free from their immortality. I think that could be a really engaging and kind of beautiful game of, of trying to put this tortured soul to, to rest in a peaceful way, not trying to attack an evil lich trying to take over the world, but trying to allow somebody to die. I think that could be really interesting. Do you have a taste for the finer things in life? To many, adventuring doesn't mean bedrolls and rations and climbing gear, but rather opening nights at the theater, art galas and fine cuisine and so much more. If you'd rather cut your enemies with words than swords, then I think the aristocrat patron would be a fine place for your party to end up. So the aristocrat group patron can be a, a very generic kind of vanilla, I need you all to go out and protect my interests kind of thing, but I think it really shines in this idea of a political intrigue campaign or, or something that's much smaller in nature. And I, I think it could work really well. And I think the types of characters that could work well, uh, there are a bunch of different bard colleges that could work really well in, in a campaign centered around an aristocrat patron. College of Eloquence, Glamour, or Whispers would all have skills for a wide variety of types of games centered around an aristocrat's circle and working in the upper parts of a city and trying to maneuver this almost political intrigue, but it's just trying to navigate that upper city arena of, of drama and talking about people behind their back and planning evidence that this person doesn't like this person. A lot of different bards, but especially eloquence, glamour, and uh, whispers could work really well in that kind of game. And then additionally, the rogue mastermind obviously could work well manipulating people with their machinations and being at the right hand of this aristocrat and, and working all of their enemies against each other so that their patron stays elevated and above it all. So a pretty obvious type of campaign that you could center around an aristocrat patron is one where the party is working for a minor aristocrat that's trying to work their way up in the world and the party is tasked with going around and creating socially embarrassing scenarios for the enemy of their aristocrat to bumble and fall, allowing space for them to continue to elevate. And where the campaign goes from there is a thousand different directions, whether or not you want the patron to turn on the party, welcome them with open arms and elevate them. But that's a really great blank template for this type of campaign. Another one that I really like is the idea of uh, the party working for an aristocrat. They're, they're hired to come in and are told like they, they will be paid well, they will live a life of luxury, but this aristocrat is actually a monster hunter, is, is somebody that has come to the city and slowly over time built up their wealth, gotten themselves into a position to where they could strike and they need the party's assistance because there are other nobles in this city that are secretly agents of fiends and the party must go around and hunt them and take them out because they are working in the city to destabilize it, to make way for devils and demons and whatever to invade the city. And so the party is given jobs to go around and assassinate these targets because they are uh, hidden agents within the city working for fiends. Of course they're not. They're just the enemies of this really horrible rich person that wants his enemies killed and the party is given a righteous reason to do it. And when they find out, I bet your characters are gonna be pretty darn upset. Now for an adventurer with an itch to operate on the other side of the law, any full-time thief or bandit will tell you to never underestimate the value of backup. 
and working for the crime syndicate patron gives you all the fun of a life of crime and all the infrastructure of working at a cold, lifeless corporate gig. Now, in terms of characters that can operate well in a crime syndicate group patron game, Let's kick things off with the obvious. A thief or assassin rogue subclass will work just well in this type of game, especially depending on the type of jobs that you're gonna be doing. Uh, these might not work in the same game, but thief would work really well in one, assassin would work really well in the other, and if you're a diverse crew, then why not both? The Ranger's Gloomstalker would be at home in any dark alley or back room commonly associated with the work of this type of patron as well. And Way of the Shadow Monk would be a perfect fit for any job that requires infiltrating a place that you're not supposed to be in. Now, types of campaigns that can be centered around a crime syndicate group patron, obviously one that is centered around a Robin Hood-esque mission of stealing from the wealthy and redistributing that wealth to the poor is a classic and one that I think most players would be up for and have a good time. This one can be kind of tricky in terms of a group patron because you want to get the temperature of your players early on to understand how they would feel about operating as morally gray characters, people that exist on the other side of the law. And if you know that you have some players that might balk a little bit at that concept, giving them this type of campaign where yes, you're on the other side of the law, but the law is wrong and you are bringing justice to an unjust world will smooth that over quite nicely. Another option is a small syndicate looking to make its way up in the world, hiring your party to help clear the way for their ascent by taking out syndicates that are directly above them so they can easily one after the other, climb up each step. And additionally, there is a traveling Thieves Guild style game where you go around from city to city and spot corrupt politicians and make their life not so great, including stealing perhaps their ill-gotten goods. Now, you don't redistribute the wealth because you all have to operate somehow, but you do still hurt the corrupt. And lastly, a great concept for a campaign centered around a crime syndicate group patron is, well, it's the premise for campaign two of Eberron Renewed, the actual play podcast that I DM, link down in the description below. I would tell you, but spoilers. There is safety in numbers in more arenas than just the battlefield. For centuries, artisans of all kinds have come together to ensure resources, fair pricing, and training for up and coming artists. And such guilds need members of all kinds to ensure that they can grow, thrive, and stick around for the long haul. So the guild patron is one that honestly is kind of the trickiest when it comes to figuring out what type of characters will work well in it. Because a guild can be anything. The Fighters Guild, Wizards Guild, Blacksmiths, Cobblers. So guild is a really kind of amorphous term when it comes to locking down the type of player that can work well in a campaign centered around it. But I will say that characters that maybe have an itch for wanderlust or whose features uh, include planes hopping magic that take them all over the world, maybe won't fit in well in this style of campaign. Now, obviously it depends on the type of guild that you're dealing with, but guilds typically are very centered and very close and have a central hub that they work from, and generally speaking, operate within a certain sphere. And so building characters that can work well in that dynamic, characters that value community, will work really well in this type of game. But like I said, guilds come in many forms and I'm sure Interplanar Express Delivery Incorporated would love to have you. Now, building off of the previous reference that I just made for player types, the party could be a group of new hires brought into a guild to make deliveries to cities, nations, continents, planes, and continue to escalate from there. This is a really great flexible campaign type to center around a guild group patron because the party always comes back to headquarters, gets their payment and gets their next delivery, but you can scale as the party scales in power. And then you could introduce some world threatening entity or some more linear story if you want to down the road. Or the party works for a, a guild and the party's job is to go around to towns and protect them, provide service, in the form of protection as a form of advertisement for the guild's wares. So your job is only half done once you've beaten off the bandits from destroying the town. Now it's time to go around, shake hands, and tell everybody what great work 
the guild does. And oh yes, this armor is so fine. Can I take your order? Because we may not be around next time. So you better buy a few swords just in case they come back. Do you have skills that need refinement? Or perhaps you just operate well in a strict hierarchy of authority. Or maybe you just want your university fees paid for. Either way, the military force patron is a fine place to apply. So the military force patron, this one is, once again, it, I feel like it's a common campaign type. It's nothing new to have a group of adventurers that are part of a larger military force. And so when you look at the types of characters that can work well in a campaign, this one kind of like the guild is very amorphous. The battle master fighter is a great commanding officer if the party is like a, a unit in the military if your table can handle that kind of dynamic of having one player be the commanding officer of the group. Uh, additionally, the rogues scout subclass obviously would work really well from a military force standpoint. Or of course, lastly, the cleric's war domain. Their god wants them to serve in the military, go out and fight holy war and battle. And so it would make perfect sense to include that character type in a military force game. Now, the first campaign type that you can run with a military force patron is kind of obvious, but the party is an elite force of soldiers sent out to disrupt trade lines and assassinate enemy generals all at the behest of their commanding officer. Straightforward, classic, but once again, gives you that flexibility that I think is really vital for a lot of D&D games, especially one built around the military. Another interesting idea for a military force campaign is a former military unit is brought back together years after the war ended because maybe their old commanding officer has tracked down the architect behind an attack that had a huge civilian death toll, and now it's time to exact some vengeance off the books, still with the support of the military, but getting paid under the table. And lastly, because a military force patron does not need to only operate on the traditional battlefield, the party could be a group of sleeper agents that are sent out into cities to fight in a post-war arena, trying to commit espionage or sabotage, things like that in a Cold War style of game. If you have an unshakable belief in a higher order, or believe in the virtue of spreading your faith to others, or need to fight the enemies of your god, then you can find worse patrons than a religious order. You will be greatly rewarded. Maybe not in this life. Tithes have been down this month after all. So the religious order group patron, this one, once again, a lot of these aren't rewriting the book on anything, but there are ways that you can tweak them to make them really shine and different than kind of your bog standard holy mission style campaign. So the types of characters that could work really well in a game centered around the religious order, the barbarian's path of the zealot is one that easily comes to mind. And it's great because it's against type. Normally we think of religious party members is very stoic, very controlled. And so having a barbarian raging straight at the enemies with righteous fury is, is great and a great addition in D&D in, in general, but I think works really well in this type of game. The Celestial Warlock could have tapped into the powers of an angel that sits at the right hand of the religious order's god, and so they are a blessed addition to the party and welcomed with open arms. Or the Divine Soul Cleric could be a descendant from an important figure in the religious order's history, and therefore, perhaps their coming was prophesized long ago, and now they are here, welcomed and working for the religious order in a very elevated status. If you'd like to earn the praises of royalty, but military work seems too dirty and violent, then playing the political game is a surefire way to success with the sovereign patron. Just don't mess up or else it's a surefire way to the gallows, but I'm sure you'll do fine. So obviously the Bard's College of Whispers is the perfect character to play in a Royal Machinations style campaign, working for a sovereign and trying to navigate the political sphere. Additionally, an Oath of the Crown Paladin will also fit in well, perhaps as a member of the Royal Guard trying to maintain order in the Royal Court. And an Assassin Rogue would be a valuable asset for a certain kind of sovereign. Any of these characters would work well, as well as many more. These three just jumped out at me as like, yes, if you're running a sovereign group patron type game, then I would encourage players to look at these particular subclasses. So the first campaign type is the party operates to assist a young deposed sovereign 
and their duty is to ensure that they can ascend to their crown once again. Nothing new, but I think that this one, like some other ones, give you a lot of flexibility to tell this story in unique and interesting ways and what the true nature of this deposed sovereign is. Were they potentially going to be a good ruler or a terrible one? And then your party has to reconcile, do we really want this person sitting on the crown? It, it's an interesting story that you can tell. Just be careful with the ending of this story. I, I've heard that the, the ending of a story about a young deposed sovereign trying to regain her crown can sometimes fall flat on its face after about nine years of waiting. The next one is what I kind of alluded to with the College of Whispers. The party works for a sovereign that oversees a royal court full of political intrigue, threats, and knives around every corner, and the sovereign has actually tasked them with maintaining order within the court. And so the party has to go around and try to navigate the politics of all these different warring mini factions within the court and keep the peace because their sovereign doesn't want any death in the court. And so you need to go and stop assassinations. You need to stop infighting. You need to try to find a way to reconcile relationships. I think that could be a really fun campaign type for a certain type of player where once you make this alignment, okay, we've got these two people friendly. Well, this person hates this person and they used to be friends. So now they hate each other. It's like, okay, so we broke an alliance to set up. Okay, now let's and so trying to keep all the plates spinning would be a really fun game to run. Or the party serves a sovereign who hates politics, hates the court. They used to be an adventurer before they became a sovereign, and they still like to go out adventuring. And the party are the ones that have to protect the sovereign while they're out on adventures and ensure that they don't die horribly from poison, the jungle, exposure, orcs, dragons, liches, Trap. And that is all of the patrons in chapter two of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. What did you all think? Which is your favorite group patron? And do you have any great ideas for campaigns for group patrons that I missed? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.